So we're actually going to kind of shift up how this material is going to work just video wise. So I've kind of been doing these two videos where I've been separating it up based on its height and then finishing the material with its albedo, normal, roughness, etc. Um, what I'm thinking for this material is it's a little bit more complex in a way. And so the way I want to break it up is that we're going to be doing a height video and a finishing video, but we're also going to break it up into a third video where we essentially have our completed material and we go back into our graph to find areas um, to work with to allow us to expose a bunch of parameters for different things that we want. And so I'll have something kind of up on the screen right now, just kind of going through some of the parameters that uh, I'd want to expose with you guys. So that'll be in the third video for this material. So without further ado, let's go into our graph here. So I've just gone up, uh, just hit new graph there, and I've used my new template. Again, if you don't have this uh, graph template here or you don't have one to work with, that's similar to mine. You can just check out the tutorial in the description. And I've also got it uh, just linked right up here as well. So I've named mine scales. And so now the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click this guy, just drag and drop him into our 3D. So now we're gonna be able to see this in our 3D view. And I'm gonna come up to scene and I just wanna change this to a cylinder. So I wanna be able to uh, visualize my material just on this kind of rounded cylinder. I just found it was a little bit nicer for this material in specific. And then I'm also going to come up here to materials, default and edit. And this is going to allow me to visualize our height for our uh, height map. So I'm just going to bring that all the way up. And so it's not going to do uh, really anything for right now, but you can see that if I bring in something like uh, if I can spell bring in a checker one and you can see that as soon as I bring that in you can see that it's giving us some height information and if I play around with it you can see that no height and then we're able to kind of stretch it out. So I'm just going to leave that on 10 and we're going to be good to go. All right, and so now we're going to go ahead and start by creating the kind of base geometry of what we want our scales to look like. And so uh, a really good node that I've found that we can use is the uh, tile random node. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this into my histogram range and my normal there. And I'm going to bring this guy back so we've got some room. Okay. And so the nice thing about this node is that it's going to allow us to create uh, very rapidly the kind of underlying geometry for the scales. And then it's going to allow us to pretty uh, easily alter the formation of the scales without actually having to worry too much about um, messing it up or worrying about creating illogical values for our material. So by default, the tile random is going to have these uh, squares showing up. So if we come into it and we go down to pattern, we can switch this to paraboloid and we're going to get all of these uh, nice, you know, more circular rounded shapes. I want to go ahead and just bump up the scale to six by six so that we're just getting more patterns in there. And you can see that right now we've got a whole whack of different sizes and squishing and all that. And that's going to be under the size. It's going to be the random X and random Y. And if I decrease this all the way down to zero, you can see that it's just going to work like a random, uh, sorry, a regular tiling node. And so while we want it to be uh, tiled regular like this, as opposed to having these weird squashing, we're going to be able to uh, play around with some of the offsets to give us a more organic look. So I'm going to come back in and go down to our scale. And if I bring the scale up to something like eight, you can see that immediately we're going to lose a lot of uh, the information there. And all I have to do is come down to our blending mode. 
I want to change this to max. And you can see maybe, I'm not sure if you can see this on YouTube, but we got a little bit more information back because you can see that if I bring the scale down, we've got the circles almost just intersecting with one another. And that's the result of the blending mode. So max is going to allow us to see these uh, intersections between each one of these uh, shapes. But if we go to add sub, you can see that each circle is preserving its overall shape and the intersections are going to basically be uh, amongst every shape. So each shape is going to have four intersections that are going to basically go inside of its neighboring shape. And this is going to be a little bit funky with um, what we're going to do because the next node we're going to add is an edge detect because we want to essentially detect each one of the shapes and have a little bit of a border around them. So this is gonna give us a lot of weird results because we're gonna have an edge here, but we're also gonna have an edge intersecting it. So it's gonna be a little bit funky. So if I go back down to max, this is gonna give us a more um, reasonable result, something that's gonna be a little bit more predictable. So I can come back up now to our scale. Maybe bring the scale up to something like five. Also bring the scale random up. And so now we can just start playing around with these uh, different sized shapes. And now I don't want to have anything that's too drastic like this. I wanna make sure that all of our uh, paraboloids are actually intersecting with one another. So uh, if you've, got large gaps in between them like this, you've gone a little bit too far. Maybe bring the scale random down a little bit. And something like that should be cool for now. So now I'm going to come down to our position. And what the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the offset to 0.5. And it's going to give this this kind of helix looking uh, honeycomb looking effect here where we've got basically just um, a half, uh, half offset or like a crisscross pattern. And this is going to give us kind of the base um, offset for the scales. And then we can also offset random a little bit just to kind of give a little bit more organicness to it. So now you can see that in certain uh, random offsets, you can see we're going to get something kind of like this and it's going to look more like uh, corn on the cob really than anything. So try and make sure that uh, there's still a little bit of an offset. So I, I kind of just play around with it until get something that's still a little bit uh, offset, but nothing that's like too uniform. And then we can also play around with the random and the random is going to individually move each uh, shape in its own direction. So I just want to do that a little bit again to break up kind of the monotony of it. So now that's starting to look pretty cool. That's kind of, you can kind of see it's looking a little bit scale like. I also want to just bring the color random up to uh, 0.1 again, just to uh, help define some randomness. So this is going to be a good start that we're going to be able to work with. And like I said before, the next thing we want to do is we're going to add an edge detect. And you can see what the edge detect is going to do is it's going to find all of these dark points in between each one of our shapes here. And it's going to basically just create an uh, edge for it. So we're going to have these scales as kind of their own individual shapes. And hopefully you're able to see it, uh, what I was talking about earlier, how this is going to be very powerful to use our tile random because we can go ahead and just add a bunch of different uh, values. And we're going to be able to pretty much play around with this pretty seamlessly and pretty easily. And it's not really going to affect um, our material in a, a negative way. So I'm just going to control Z all of that. And so now we've got our edge detect here. 
And the parameters with the edge detect are our edge width and our edge roundness. And so our edge width is basically just what it says. We can make the edges thicker or thinner. And we can play around with the roundness so that we can have a little bit more rounded uh, scales. So I'm going to do something like, uh, let's do two. Two seems to be OK. And for our roundedness, we can do three. Uh, actually, I might want to make that. Let's try four. Four should be good. Again, beauty of Substance Designer is we can always go back and change our values. So after that, I want to get some roundedness uh, for our um, shapes here. And so one way we can do that is we're going to need to kind of add a gradient or a blur effect onto these guys. And a good node to do that is the bevel node. And so you can see it's, it's not going to actually uh, update our connection here. So I'm just going to shift and click on that guy and just plug that into there. And then it will just update our connection. So with this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our distance and I'm actually going to bring it into the negative because right now what is happening is it's taking our edge detect and it's blurring outwards towards the dark areas. And that's going to be a little bit of a problem because they're going to basically start blurring over top of each other and we're going to get this very uh, very low contrast shape and you can see that we're barely just getting any information uh, about the kind of the crevices in between our scales here. So I'm going to bring this into the negative and it's going to do basically the inverse where it's going to if I just put this on zero. Positive is going to blur outwards. Negative is going to blur inwards and you can see that as I bring this in we start to uh, blur and gradient our shapes inwards. And so this is pretty useful. So I'm going to do something like negative uh, 0.4. And now the second uh, uh, feature of this node that I want to do is I want to go ahead and start smoothing out this gradient. So you can see it's a little bit kind of sharp, kind of jagged, but as we smooth it out, you can see that it's going to start to kind of just almost blur it a little bit, make it a little bit smoother, a lot, a little bit nicer to work with. Also, just before we go ahead any further, I'm going to come up to Environment, hit Edit, and I'm just going to hit 1 just to brighten up our environment a little bit because I'm having a little bit of difficulty seeing what we're actually doing. So now the last thing that I want to do for our geometry is I want to add a little bit of a lip or a rim to each one of these scales. Because right now it's basically just a face of the scale, gradient, and a fall off basically to nothing. So I want to have a little bit of a lip here just to kind of make it feel like it's been situated um, like really on there. So for this, I'm going to add a cells one node. And I'm going to do a vector warp grayscale. And so for now, I'm just going to plug in our cells into vector warp. And you can see that pretty much all it's doing right now is it's just panning our texture because we don't have any actual vector map to uh, pan around. And so this is going to use pretty much just a color gradient based off of any geometry that we give it. And it's going to uh, warp our cells around that vector. So working with the bevel node, it's pretty nice because we get our height output, but we also get a normal output. And you can see that if we come down to the bottom here, we can play around with the intensity of the normal as well. I'm just going to change my normal format to OpenGL because I use OpenGL uh, in my preferences. 
If that doesn't even make any sense to you, don't worry about it. You can just leave it on DirectX. So I'm going to take my normal map here and plug that guy in. And so now you can see that, well, nothing's happened. And that's because we have an intensity of zero. But as I bring that up, you can see that we start to warp our cells around the shape of our scales here. And that's pretty cool. It's pretty powerful. I'm going to go ahead and change my vector to OpenGL as well. Again, the difference doesn't really make uh, that much of a discre uh, discrepancy with your material, but I just like to work in OpenGL. So you can see that with this, we're just going to get some nice information that's conforming to the shape of our geometry. And that just adds a little bit more of an organicness to it, a little bit more flow. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a blend onto our bevel because I want to add this over top of our material. So I'm gonna plug this guy in so we can see it. And so if we just play around with the intensity of this, you can see what it's doing is it's just warping the heck out of our cells here. So we can come into our cells. We can also play around with the scale of this. We get a different result as well as the disorder. I'm gonna do something like 30. And if we come back to the blend, I want to mask off certain areas of our um, bevel here because right now we've got it kind of just filtering over top of the entire thing. Like we've just splattered it across. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our bevel and I'm going to plug that into our opacity. And so you can see right now what that's going to essentially do is anything that is a whiter value will take whatever is plugged into the top input and whatever is a dark or black value will take whatever is in the background. And so this is gonna be handy for us because we actually have a pretty good node that allows us to manipulate these gradients to get on the rim of where we want our actual uh, cells to show up because right now we've kind of got it inverted where it's showing up on the top but it's not showing up along the rim where we wanted it so with that I'm going to add a curve node and what the curve node is going to do for us is it's going to allow us to manipulate the gradient so that we can alter the position of our uh, grayscale values so if I double click on that guy and I double click on my graph here you can see that as I move around I'm shifting or shaping the geometry but all I'm really doing is I'm just creating a mask that is then changing the blending values between both our vector here and our bevel so if I just click on this guy and then single click on our curve we'll be able to see that if I invert these values and I take our black handle, if I can grab it, and bring that all the way up to white, and you can see that it's uh, denoted by a one or a white value. And I bring our handle over here all the way down. You can see essentially what I've done is I've taken our bevel and just inverted it. And that's going to now allow us to show our cells kind of in that, uh, kind of in the area of the, um, the scales that we wanted, but it doesn't look too good right now. It kind of looks uh, a little raunchy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just reset that to its default. And so we're gonna go about it uh, a little bit differently than how we had it because I didn't necessarily want to invert our gradient, but I do want to alter some of its values. So I'm going to just double click in the center here and I'm going to bring this guy up. And you can see that that's kind of giving a nice edge to our um, scales here, but again, we're still kind of getting this showing up in the center. So I'm going to take this guy here, this is our most white value in our gradient. You can see that it's going to basically change 
the center piece here because that's the whitest part of our material. And as I bring that down, it's going to create a black value. So you can see that we've kind of got more of the effect that we wanted because we're still maintaining a black value in these uh, crevices here, but we're also now got a black value with a gradient from the sides. So we can play around with the, uh, the smoothness of it. I can also bring this in, which is going to increase uh, basically the spacing of our uh, crevices there. I'm going to bring that back down a little bit. I can double click to add another point and you can see that we can almost create like a stepping pattern as well. So if I do this here, you can see that that's going to create more of a black value and that's going to give us almost like this solid rim. Now that's a little bit too harsh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play around with it to make it a little bit more smooth. And so we can play around with these handles to alter the gradient. Ultimately creating a very robust mask, which again is just blending between these two nodes here. And that's looking pretty cool. So now the last thing I want to do with our blend here is I'm just going to switch our blending mode down to overlay. And so this is just going to give us a little bit more of a fine tuned um, effect for our rim. And we can also come back into our curve here and just play around with it to find something that works for you. And I think that looks pretty cool. So I'm going to stick with that. And so now that I've created the basic geometry for what we want to do with our scales, I want to go ahead and start creating some uh, deterioration damage for kind of the lower areas uh, of our scales, which is basically going to kind of like create some scratches kind of coming up from the uh, lower areas of our scales. So the way I'm going to start that is I'm going to just come down here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to come up here instead, go over top. And I'm going to create a cells for node. And with this, I'm going to create a blend. And I'm going to duplicate this guy and plug him in over top. And so with this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a mask to separate the two and have them at different scales. So this guy up top here, it's going to be around, we'll give him 13. And this guy down here, it's going to be closer to 18. So you can see that they're at different scales. And I'm also going to just play around with the disorder as well, to add some randomness to it. And so we're going to get a little bit of a larger one and a little bit of a smaller one. And so what we're going to do with these is we're going to create a Gaussian noise. And plug this guy into our blend. And this is going to allow us to blend between the two like we had done previously down here with our mask. However, it's a little bit too uh, noisy and it's a little bit too uh, gradiated. It's a, not as binary as we need it. So the first issue is the scale. So I'm going to bring this all the way down to six. And then I'm going to add a histogram scan. And what we can do with the histogram scan is basically move our way through the range of the uh, the image that we've plugged in. But we can also pretty much use it to 
mask off the areas. So now that we've got more of a binary mask, we can just create this random mask using the disorder of our noise. And you can see what this is going to do if we again play around with the disorder is just create different pockets of larger and smaller uh, cells. You can see that if we scale this down, we've got areas of smaller noise mixed in with areas of larger noise. So I'm going to bring this back down. Maybe we'll make this one 20, just so that there is a good difference. So now with this blend, I'm going to add another edge detect. And I'm going to bring the roundness way down, as well as the edge width, because we're going to be using these as cracks. So I want to make sure that they're very sharp, very uh, thin. And honestly, just bringing the roundness down to zero. But you can see that we're getting larger pockets with smaller areas. And these are going to be great for getting interesting looking cracks. So with our edge detect, I now want to plug this through a directional warp because I want to add some variation and randomness, a little bit of noise to the uh, actual lines themselves because this is a little bit too straight and a little bit too uh, uniform and it's going to look completely man-made. So if I add a clouds, mm, let's do clouds one. You can see this is going to give us a lot of grayscale and noise information. And if I plug this into our clouds, we're immediately going to get a lot of distorted values. And this is going to be pretty good uh, just for getting more realistic cracks. So I'm going to bring this down to like eight just so that it's not so noisy. And again, you can play around with kind of the direction of the warp just to get some more interesting uh, crack effects there. So now that we've got our crack effects, I want to go ahead and blend them into our scales here. So on our scales, I'm going to add a, another blend node. And I'm going to plug this guy in over top. And immediately we're going to get all of this information showing up. But I want to go ahead and change the blend mode because I want to still maintain this information and only really keep the black areas, which are going to be our cracks. So the blending mode that we can use for that is going to be multiply, because multiply is going to get rid of any white value from the top input, and then overlay the black inputs over top of the bottom input here. So you can see that once we do that, we get a lot of uh, crack information, but this is a little bit too intense and it's also not in the area that we wanted it to be in. Remember, we wanted it to be a little bit more down towards the uh, kind of the rim area and lower. So one way that we can go about creating another mask for that is if we go ahead and select histogram select. And what this is going to do is it's going to take in a grayscale image and it's going to allow us to basically move through and select a specific range in a grayscale gradient. So you can see if I plug in our bevel here, we're going to be able to essentially uh, sift through our grayscale from black to white. So you can see that if I move the position down, we're going to get our kind of lower crack areas or our crevice areas. And as I move the position to one, it's going to work its way up to the whitest value and every value in between. And you can see essentially it's gone from black to white. We can also play around with the range. So we have a larger range. And we can play around with the contrast as well. So this is a very powerful node to allow us to basically uh, select a range of a grayscale gradient and kind of isolate it to be used for a mask. So with that in mind, I'm going to plug this into our opacity. 
And now I'm going to basically just highlight our blend and select our histogram select. And so now I'm going to decrease the contrast. And I want to bring the position all the way down because I want to essentially be working from our lowest area upwards. So I'm going to bring our position down pretty much to, well, I'll bring it to zero. And you can see that we're kind of already getting the effect that we want to get. And if we play around with the range, it's going to allow us to basically unhide or unmask the cracks upwards onto our uh, scales here. And we could play around with the contrast too if you want it to be very sharp or if you want it to be kind of like it fades away a little bit, you can have the contrast very low. And I'm gonna just bring down the range. And I'm also gonna come into our opacity and put this at about 0.5, just so that it's not as uh, deep of cracks, so you can see. We play around with the opacity. This is definitely going to really cut into our material, but if we bring it down, maybe to around 0.4, they're just gonna be not as deep cuts. So that's just going to add a little bit more of a uh, cracking effect, make it look a little bit more natural. All right, and so now that we've got uh, the cracks going along our rim, I wanna go ahead and start creating two variations of cracks that are going to be running across the faces of our scales. And so the first one we're gonna create is going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit smaller, a little bit not as deep cuts. And then we're gonna go in for the really, really deep stuff. So off to the side here, I'm going to go ahead and create a tile sampler node. And what we're gonna do is basically create our own version of the scratches generator. And so these are basically gonna do the same thing, but I like to create my own just because it adds a little bit more um, customizability to it. So if you wanna go ahead and just pretty much uh, remove the tile sampler in place of the scratches generator, by all means go for it. But I like to use tile sampler just to get a little bit more edge in. So with our tile sampler here, I'm gonna go in and go to our pattern and change the pattern to paraboloid. And then I'm gonna come down to size and I'm gonna bring it down on the X so that we're just gonna get these nice little slivers of cuts here. So now we can bring the scale up, something like three, play around with the scale random, can't really see it because they're all overlapping. So I'm just going to bring position random up. And we can also change the size of the Y past one. So if we just click here and say something like three, now we're gonna get more uh, vertical stripes there. So we can play around with the offset as well, but we don't really need to. And I'm gonna come down to rotation and just do a uh, rotation random. And then I'm also gonna just mask a few. And again, we can even you know later on expose this parameter if we want just to basically mask off the scratches completely or you know, keep a few and just change the amount as we wish. I'm also going to color random and that's just gonna give us a little bit more depth to our uh, believability here. And as I work my way back up, again, maybe playing around with the scale random. I'm gonna go into our X and Y amount and I'm gonna change these up to something like 50 and 50, just so we have a ton of different scratches. So off of our tile sampler here, I'm gonna add a swirl grayscale. And you can see what this is gonna do is it's just gonna basically swirl them around and uh, make them a little bit wavier. So I wanna basically increase this so that we cover our entire texture set here. 
So if I come up to our times, we can bu buff that guy up. And then we can come down to the amount. And so the amount is going to be a uh, negative and positive spectrum. So you can see that we can basically invert the uh, direction with which we're swirling. So I'm going to do something like 0.25 just to add a little bit of uh, direction to our scratches, but it's nothing too uh, crazy. Actually, maybe we'll go to 0.3 just to have a little bit more uh, oomph to it. And this is just going to give us, again, a little bit more believable direction than just straight man-made uh, cuts. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a directional warp. And so what we're going to be able to do with this is we're going to, again, be able to utilize our bevel here or our geometry to create a uh, warping value so that our scratches are going to be able to kind of use the geometry as an input to bend it and move it in a way that's going to allow us to almost shape the scratches like it organically fits onto our material. So I'm going to plug our blend here into the uh, intensity input. And you can see that once, once we do that, our scratches are going to kind of fit around the shapes of our scales there. And we can play around with the direction and play around with the intensity. And again, that's a little extreme, but you can see what it's going to be basically be doing. So I'm going to do something like 15. And another thing that's going to be cool about this is it's going to allow us to break up the scratches. You can see that uh, if we take a look here, this area here is two separate uh, scales. But if we take a look, we would have scales basically going from one scratch over to the other one. And it would kind of look like we just slapped on this uh, texture over top of everything. We want it, again, to kind of blend in and seem very natural uh, happening. So this is going to allow us to kind of just position those scratches so that it breaks up that monotony. And so you don't really see scratches transition over to each other as uh, easily. The last thing I want to do with these scratches is have them not be so straight and have them be a little bit janky and a little bit scratchy. So I'm going to add a slope blur grayscale node. And to disrupt uh, kind of the smoothness of these, I'm going to use a fractal sum base. And if you've watched any of my previous tutorials, you know I love using a, a slope blur and a fractal sum combination. It's just so powerful. So if I plug that guy in there immediately, it's going to basically destroy everything that you have and ever loved. And <laughs> that's okay because we can bring the samples right up and bring the intensity way down. And now, oh, look at that. We're starting to get back some semblance of what our scratches were. We can also play around with the blending mode. And again, basically the difference is that min is going to kind of like with our bevel subtract inwards on our white values here. Max is going to blend outwards and blur is going to basically kind of be a mix between the two. And so right now the intensity or the, the noisiness is a little too much. And we can fix that in our fractal sum. So if I come into our fractal sum here, you can see it's pretty, uh, pretty noisy. But as we decrease the max level, you can see that it starts to get a little bit softer. And this is going to affect our scratches in kind of the same way. So you can see that at a level of 11, it's a little bit too much. But as we bring it down, we're going to get something that's a little bit uh, a little bit bigger, but not as noisy. And we can come back into our slope, just change the intensity right down. Maybe play around with the min levels as well.
And I'm going to change the blending mode from blur to max. And this is just going to allow us to kind of chip away some extra detail from the scratches on our uh, shells here, our scales. So I'm going to add a blend node and plug this blend into the background. And then I'm going to just shift click this guy here. Actually, before I do that, I want to plug our scratches into the top. And then I'm going to shift click and steal that guy there. So now we're going to be able to just visualize what's going on. And you can see again, we're going to be able to see whatever's in the top node because we need to change our blending mode. And so while over with our uh, rim cracks here, we used a multiply, that's because we wanted to keep the black value and get rid of the white. However, with here, we want to keep the white value and get rid of the black. So the blending mode that we'll use for that is going to be subtract. And you can see once we do that, we're gonna get our scratches showing up over top of everything. And that's gonna be pretty cool but it's immediately going to lose its charm because again these are super deep and they look really just kind of super bad so one way we can go about this is just really decreasing the opacity like i'm talking just crank that bad boy down now i'm going to have something like 0.05 because i want to have very superficial scratches and again that's starting to look cool, but I think that maybe we have a little bit too much. So I'm gonna come into our patterns here, maybe just come all the way down and mask a lot of that off. Cool, just so that we're getting some information, but not too much. And maybe like 0.95 because what I'm gonna do is repeat this process, except I'm going to blend them in a little bit more so that they kind of dig in a little bit deeper. So what I can do is uh, basically just select these guys here and hit Control D to duplicate. And so we're gonna have all of the same connections as we did for the uh, chain that we've created. But now this time what I can do is change the warp intensity to something like 25, change the direction. We can play around again with the uh, intensities as well. And if I add a blend after our initial blend here, doing the same exact thing where we go and do subtract, I can use these and just have them as a little bit more, a little bit deeper cracks. There's something like that. And so that way we've, we're using the same resources, but now we can have almost separate cracks and affect them individually of each other to get some pretty cool results. And again, we're using one simple tile sampler node. So if I want to get rid of all of these cracks, we can just come into our mask random and just completely remove all of them. And so now we've created the base geometry of our scales. We've added a rim as well as rim deterioration and some cracks. The kind of final thing I want to do to kind of deteriorate our scales is I want to go ahead and add a little bit more uh, directionality and sloping to it. So what we can do with that is we can go ahead and basically create gradients for each one of these scales so that the top of it is a little bit more uh, pressed inwards on the geometry and then as we get to the bottom it's a little bit more uh, flayed out. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to create a flood fill node. And so the way that flood fill nodes operate is they need very defined boundaries like we've created back here. And you can see that we've got very defined boundaries 
and each scale is basically its own separate entity. So if I take this guy and plug it into our flood fill node, you'll be able to see that we're getting the, a vector for each one of these uh, individual scales. You can see that if we do something that's not as defined, we're going to struggle a little bit to find um, what information we're looking for here. So you're gonna need something that's a little bit more defined, and I'm gonna use the edge detect right at the beginning of our graph here. So I'm gonna bring this guy right over. And so what information we're going to be able to draw from this is going to be a flood fill to gradient. And you can see that we got a lot of flood fill specific nodes here. But the one we're going to be using is to gradient. And immediately we're going to get this uh, gradient for each one of these guys here. And you can see that as I bring this around, it's basically just creating a uh, gradient across each one individually. We can even play around with the angle variation so that they're not all facing the same direction. And if that's what you want to do for your scales, the ease of accessibility is right there. So I'm going to bring the angle variation down. I might bring it up to like 0.05 just again. Try and change as many uh, uniformity as, as much as we can. And so I want to make sure that this is with the darker values up top and the lighter values down below. And so we can play around with the, uh, the values of the gradient as well, just by multiplying by bounding box size. And so this is going to allow us to just get a little bit more flexibility with um, our texture set here. So again, I'm gonna add a slope blur grayscale because I want to go ahead and add a little bit more deterioration to it because it's going to allow us to add uh, well first a bit of a gradient for these scales but also inversely uh, it's going to allow us to add some destruction and deterioration so again I'm going to add a fractal sum base and if we click on this guy here we can drag our samples all the way up, bring the intensity way down. Just play around with the max level. Get a little bit larger uh, destruction there. And I'm gonna use min this time. So if we wanna have a little bit more deterioration, We'll be able to do that. And so now we're going to be able to blend this in over top of our material already. So if I go ahead and add another blend and I plug this guy in over top, you can kind of see what it's going to do as we're going to have the darker area push our scales in and kind of work outwards. But we're going to need to switch the blending mode again. And so if we're thinking critically here, I kind of want this to alter the values of my grayscale here. And so the blending mode that I'm going to use is going to be multiply. And so it's just going to basically take the brighter values and get rid of them from our uh, image above, our, our top layer, and it's going to give us with the uh, provide us with the darker values, and it's going to be a very very uh, subtle effect, but it's just going to help push everything inwards, and again give us a little bit more uh, stepping deterioration for our scales. Okay, and so after we've kind of um, add a little bit of sloping information to our scales, I want to go ahead and just kind of bump up the. Uh, Kind of the color or the grayscale values for our scales overall and so what i'm going to do is on our blend here i'm going to add a curve node 
And again, this is going to allow us to kind of just play around with the gradients as they are and give a little bit more uh, control over the form and the shape of them. So in here, I'm going to just double click on our gradient. And I'm going to be able to just bring this guy up over all, make sure that we get a nice kind of rounded, um, kind of just like a rounded gradient there to still have a little bit of the, uh, the roundedness of the scales. And I'm also going to take our top value, our white value, and just bring that guy down just a little bit. And you can see that uh, if I bring this all the way down, it's going to take the center because that's our brightest value. And it's going to bring it to black. So we don't want to go that far. If I bring this guy kind of back up just so that it, we can kind of think of this curve here as kind of the curve of the geometry. So if we kind of come in real close here, you can kind of think of this curve here as kind of being this curve on our scales. So we kind of want to have it come off to a little bit of a plateau just to kind of give it a little bit more roundedness, but um, kind of not, uh, not too much of a, of a slope. So with that, I want to go ahead and start adding a little bit more uh, waviness or a little bit more um, large scale deterioration to the, the edges of our scales here. So I'm going to add a slope blur grayscale. And the input is going to be a Gaussian. I'm going to plug that guy in. I'm going to make sure that our samples are way up, get some nice quality samples, bring our intensity way down. I want to go ahead and use the uh, min mode. Again, min kind of takes away from the geometry. Max kind of pushes outwards and blur is kind of a mix between the two. So I'm going to go with min and I'm going to come into our Gaussian. And I'm going to bring the scale right down so that we get larger uh, deterioration. If I come back into here and just maybe bring the intensity up a little bit, we'll be able to see what it's doing. And then again, we can also play around with the disorder to get a random variation. Depends on what you want. But that looks pretty cool. Kind of just getting that kind of stepping effect. So that's looking pretty good. So now that we've uh, refactored the gradients of our scales, I'm going to go ahead because I want to start making the geometry for in between, kind of like the kind of the fleshy skin areas of our scales. So I'm going to go down here. And I'm going to start by creating a cells node. And this is going to give us kind of the basis of kind of like the skin wrinkles or the skin folds. And I'm going to bring the scale of this right down to something like 17, just so that we get a little bit larger uh, folds. Again, you can play around with the disorder to get something funky. And I'm going to duplicate this guy with Control D. And I'm going to make this one something like 70. Make it really, really tiny. And so what we're going to do is basically just blend between these two different uh, sizes here to get kind of a, um, a mixture of smaller and larger kind of skin folds. So I'm going to add a blend and plug these guys together. And so we're going to get the uh, foreground input showing up. So what I want to do is I want to just basically preserve the uh, darker values of the large uh, folds and kind of get rid of the lighter values to overlay on top of our smaller folds. So with the blending mode, I'm just going to select multiply and that's basically going to allow us to uh, keep those larger areas while preserving the uh, smaller areas as well. 
and you can play around with the uh, blending mode or the blending opacity. And I might take our cells up top, maybe make that a little bit smaller, like 24. Actually, we'll bring that down. We'll compromise and say uh, 20. And so I'm just going to go ahead and steal this guy here, just so that we can see what's going on in our material. So the next thing I'm going to do with this guy is once again do a slope blur grayscale, adding a Gaussian noise. And I'm going to plug this guy into our intensity. And this is again just going to add some randomness and some, uh, some slight blurring to certain areas of our material. So I'm going to increase the samples, bring the intensity way down. This time I'm going to select max because I kind of want to get some uh, blending and some folds moving outwards of the geometry here. And then I'm also going to kind of play around with the scale. So if we do uh, a lower scale, we kind of get larger shapes. And again, increasing the scale is going to give us a little bit noisier uh, of an impact. I'm going to do something like 25, just kind of get best of both worlds, just a little bit. And then the last thing I want to do is I'm going to add a histogram range. And so what the histogram range is going to allow us to do is basically alter the range of our uh, values, our grayscale values, kind of in the same vein as if we were using a levels node. So you can see that as I basically crunch the, uh, the output values, we're getting a less contrasted uh, value for our grayscale. And that's essentially what the histogram range is going to do, is it's just crunching in the final output of our values so that we can have a more contrasted or less contrasted uh, grayscale value for this texture. As well, the position is going to allow us to uh, change the overall value of everything in this texture uniformly. So you can see that I've decreased basically the contrast of our gradient, but I can also make everything uniformly brighter or uniformly darker. And so that's going to be pretty easy or pretty handy, I should say, when we're blending this with our scales, because we can then have a little bit more control over um, the overall gradient of the skin while maintaining the uh, integrity of the scales. So we're not actually altering the scales or the positioning of the skin and the scales when we blend them together. So I'm just going to click on this guy here, come into this here, and just reset to default values. And so now I'm going to steal this guy back and plug it in. And I'm going to bring these guys back a little bit. So the final thing that I want to do before we blend the skin together is I want to kind of use our scales to kind of subtract away some values from our skin so that when we're overlaying them, it kind of looks like there's a little bit of a pocket um, underneath our scales where they've kind of just been pushed in to the skin or have grown out of the skin. So I'm going to add a blend. And I'm going to use our final uh, node in our gradient refactor here. And I'm going to plug this guy in. So if I come into our blend and I hit subtract, you can see what it's done is it's just pretty much taken the white values of our scales, subtracted that from our skin, and just kind of left the in-between areas. However, that's a little bit too uh, sharp, and that's going to leave a little bit of a uh, kind of like an artifacting um, issue, I guess we'll say, with our material. So I'm going to just add a 
blur high quality grayscale and increase the quality and decrease the intensity so that we're not having such sharp lines. And we're just going to kind of blur it out just a little bit. So you can see that now it's going to be a little bit nicer um, kind of in the areas between where our uh, scales are. And we can also go ahead and just decrease the opacity as well because I don't want it to be uh, completely gone. I don't want the basically the information from our skin to be completely gone here because if this is still visible and there's kind of like a smooth surface underneath that's not going to look too good. So I'm going to just bring our opacity down to something like 0.7 so that you can see that the skin in between the scales is definitely higher than when it would be underneath the scales but we're still getting that uh, skin information underneath. So now with this blend here, I'm going to go ahead and do a height blend. And I'm going to plug this guy into our top and plug this guy into our bottom. And so you can see, boom, immediately what it's done is it's just taken the, the skin layers or the skin uh, information and plugged it in between our uh, scales here. So if I go ahead and just steal this guy here, plug that in, we immediately get our skin showing up in between our scales and we can play around with the, uh, the, the offset of these. So if we increase this, the farther in the, uh, the scales go, and again, and decrease this, we can actually have almost like the skin is uh, pushed out more than the scales are, but that's not really the look I was going for. So I'm going to just bring this back up to something like 0.6. Actually, that might still be 0.7. And so now what we can also do is if we come back down to our histogram range, this is going to allow us to alter the geometry of the skin without actually uh, necessarily having to alter the scales. If I increase the range, you can see that we're getting more uh, range in the folds of the skin. And then we can also uh, come back up to either the height blend here and play around with the height offset. Or we can also control it from this node here and just play around with the position to make it a little bit darker. So it kind of just feeds back in or out of our scales here. So that's pretty cool. It's nice to have a control like that in kind of two different areas to give you just more control over the entirety of uh, the material that you're working on. So that's looking pretty cool. Um, and I think this is going to conclude the geometry portion of our material. So make sure to check out the following two videos where we go ahead and finish the outputs to get our color, normal roughness, etc. And then further beyond that, we're going to take a look at expanding a bunch of parameters to make this a pretty versatile material.